Oh, hey there. I'm just getting ready to join Monique Fountain, the Tidal Wetland Program Director for the Elkhorn Slough Reserve, out for a salt marsh bio blitz. A bio blitz is where you go out into a place like your backyard, or in our case, a salt marsh, and you document every organism that you can find. And the idea is that this gives scientists who look at your data an idea of what was there and how much wildlife was there in that spot at that time. And over time, this gives everybody a, a much better understanding of biodiversity in an area like your county or a place as big as your state or even across the entire world. So we are going out to Hester Marsh, which is 60 acres of restored salt marsh to see what wildlife is returning. And I encourage you to follow us out there virtually. Come on along. So here we are at the Hester Marsh Restoration Project, and this is a really wonderful example of a coastal salt, salt, coastal salt marsh ecosystem restoration project. We restored about 65 acres of wetlands that were historically diked and drained. So when they were diked and drained, then the land dried up or subsided, and when um, the dikes were broken then, the land doesn't come back up and it remained low and not high enough to support healthy marsh. So what we had to do is bring in soil to bring it back up. So we brought in over 200,000 cubic yards of soil to raise the elevation of the marsh plain so that it once again, the marsh could survive on it. It's been about a year and a half since construction, since the big tractors went away and everything opened back up. And we're here today to look and see what animals have returned and what plants are here. So let's go take a look. So a bird that I haven't been able to get a photo of, but have been able to identify via sound, is that red-winged blackbird making that metallic-y sound that you hear. Just hang out in this mudflat area. Do 
you know if you have any males or females? Ooh, good question. So with crabs, um, there's actually a really easy way to tell whether they're male or female. Uh, crabs actually do have a tail, even though it doesn't look like it. If you flip a crab over gently, you'll find that on the bottom side, there is a tail. In this case, it's a big rounded tail, which tells me that it's a female, because the females use their rounded tail to actually lay their eggs. So instead of forming a nest somewhere, they will lay, or she will lay all of her eggs, which are in the thousands, on this tail on the underside of it. And then she can carry her nest around, kind of like a, a little uh, baby backpack on her belly. And the males, opportunity again to see how these crabs move into a completely new area, an area that's never had crabs in it before. And that's an exciting thing for us to see. And so we'll, we'll keep looking at that and seeing what happens. Have you ever wondered how crabs grow? They have this really hard shell on the outside and you think it would be really difficult and it is. They can't actually grow this shell as it is, but they can get out of this shell. And that's what soft shell crabs are. So what they do is they have this molt line and about once a year they do what's called molting. So there's a molt line around the outside of the carapace and I'll see this is a crab. You look at this crab you think it might be dead but it's super light and that's how I know that it's a, a molt. And if you tease apart the back here you can actually lift up the back of what's called this top part, the carapace. And it comes right off and this is that molt line. And so what happens is as they start to pull in the nutrients from their shell, because they don't want to lose those nutrients, they pull them back into their body. It actually separates the carapace at this line called the molt line. And when it's completely separate, they can actually back out and they, they back out of their shell completely. They're, they back out of their gills. They even back out of their eyeballs because you can still see the eyeballs in here. So they back out of everything and then they pull in a lot of seawater and it actually increases their size. And then over the next week or so, they harden, that shell hardens. So when you're eating soft shell crab, you're actually eating a crab that's in the process of that molting stage and in the process of growing bigger. And we'll do this about once a year until they reach what's called the terminal molt, where they no longer molt and they've reached their maximum size. There are all sorts of creatures from worms to shrimp to clams that might be living in the mud here. And over the next few years, we'll be really interested in seeing what recruits back into this area. In the center there, you can actually see evidence of a clam already, whether it was one that a sea otter came in and ate or whether it got pushed in here by the tide. Hey, come over here and take a look at this. See these holes that are here in the mud? These are really cool. So these are made by bat rays. And what they do is they go along the bottom of the, of the channel, just above the surface of the mud, and they use their, their wings to disrupt the surface of the mud and, and suck up any clams or little things that are living in there. And they can eat these clams because their teeth, instead of being sharp teeth, like we have, their teeth are actually rolled over into a plate and so they, they actually crush the shells by pushing, pushing their two plate, plates together and then sucking up whatever is there. But this is neat when you see all of these little holes along the bottom of the channel and you know that bat rays have been here feeding. Another sign the wildlife is returning to this restored marsh.
Pickleweed is a plant with the ability to grow in salt water. As it spreads out across the mud, it stabilizes the sediments and creates the salt marsh habitat we see throughout the Elkhorn Slough. We have a really unique opportunity out in this marsh to track and study how pickleweed grows. So what you can see down here is our researchers have found that pickleweed actually grows outward and spreads before it grows up. So you can see this kind of base here at the center and then it's spreading out. And you can check out everything around us for the most part is pickleweed, so it seems to be really taking in this area. All the pickleweed we've been looking at today was pickleweed that recruited in last year, probably between somewhere between December and February, and started to sprout out in May of last year. Here it is middle of April, and we're just starting to see the newest little seedlings coming up this year. So here, um, they is what looks like these new little seedlings, little pickleweed seedlings that are just coming up this year. Now most of these won't survive, but those that do will spread out and create a big colony and soon they'll grow together to cover this whole area of marsh. What we're looking at here is gum plant and what you see around the outside of it is a real kind of dried up, shriveled up plant. You might think that it's dead, but it's actually not. That's last year's growth and all the flower pods that are on the outside. But if you look right down into the middle, you're seeing the new growth coming out this year. And soon this whole area will be covered by gum plants. They seem to really like this spot. And it'll be covered in yellow flowers by probably, hopefully by the end of May. So one of the native grasses that our stewardship coordinator, Andrea Wolfolk, has gone and really with great success restored into this upland area is creeping wild rye. So that's this one that you see in front of me that's coming up in big bundles all around. Uh, what's really cool about this plant is if you can get it successfully to take in the ground, it spreads out through rhizomes, which look a little bit like roots, um, that spread underground and pop up clones everywhere. So over the next few years, we will see this native creeping wild rye really take hold in this space around us and create a nice upland buffer. Okay, so admittedly, this isn't salt marsh, but who could resist these beautiful California poppies? And they're right next to the upland section of Hester Marsh. They have that really beautiful, iconic orange flower cup, which makes them really easy to identify when you're out in the field. One of the first things our team did once Hester Marsh was open and done being constructed was start restoration efforts. So all of the flags that you see in the foreground and all of those flags off in the distance, those all indicate different plants that were planted out here um, and several different experiments trying to figure out not only what plants do the best out here, but also how to go about getting them in efficiently. One of the first experiments that we did out here was a big ecotone experiment that was designed by our uh, research coordinator, Kirsten Watson, and one of her former graduate students, Karen Tanner. And this is one of the largest ecotone experiments that we've heard about here on the West, even on the West Coast. So what we're looking at is whether or not plants in this really harsh environment can help facilitate growth of each other if they're planted close together or whether they're going to compete with each other. So if we look at the, this, these two rows here, these are all individual plants that were planted and you can count nine individual plants. This is, uh, this is Frankenia or Alkali Heath that was planted here. So these plants were planted separately and then in the row next to them all nine plants were planted together. And the question was, if they're planted together, will they compete with each other or will they help facilitate each other's growth and grow bigger? As it turns out, we didn't have a particularly uh, harsh year this last year, but we, we had quite a bit of rainfall. So what we're seeing is more plant growth or more biomass in the plants that were planted individually. So there wasn't the comp there was and, and less biomass or smaller plants in the plants that were all grown together. So in this particular year, we're seeing that competition is a bigger factor than uh, facilitation. 
looking at an experiment here that's a little bit hard to see, but it's very interesting. So on the right hand side of your screen, if you look along this channel edge, you'll see uh, this particular channel edge was made with mud that came from the bay here. And it's, it's what's called a firm channel edge and it helps provide stability to the bank. On the other side is just the regular fill or soil that we used throughout the entire project. And we wanted to compare to see if we needed to put in uh, this mud along the edge to maintain the channel stability. So you, they look actually at this tide, they look really fairly similar. So it looks like the fill soil we used really did not erode or wash away that much with the tidal energy over the last year and a half, which is really good news for future restoration projects. What we do see, the difference we do see on the right hand side with the mud that we used is that there's a lot more pickleweed growing on that. And we don't really know at this point if that is because there was maybe some seedlings or some bits of marsh, the pickleweed that were in the mud when it was placed there, or if that just happened to be a better place for recruitment. Those are the kind of questions that we'll be asking as we do all the experiments here throughout the next years. Monique and her team will break ground on phase two of the marsh's reconstruction work in the coming year. By its completion, we will have almost 120 acres of salt marsh to work with and restore. This site will be studied by our researchers for years to come. But for now, the return of the wildlife like migratory birds, sea otters, and fish suggests a bright future for Hester Marsh. That was really fun. Thank you for joining me, even if it was just virtually. Um, now it's your turn to go out and do a bio blitz. I recommend using iNaturalist. It's a community science app that folks around the world use to document nature. They have lots of easy tutorials on how to get started, and you can even contribute to statewide projects like the City Nature Challenge, which is currently hosted by the California Academy of Science. Uh, they have great tips as well for exploring in nature while also observing safe social distancing. And uh, you can check out the video details on this video uh, for links to both the City Nature Challenge and iNaturalist. Uh, I hope to see you next year for an in-person bio blitz out at Hester Marsh. And in the meantime, keep calm and science on. <laughs>